the question today is, are the sexes complementary? Uh, one of the most trotted out lines you'll hear from all sorts of people is that the sexes complement each other, with each complementing the other's respective strengths and weaknesses. And you'll hear this primarily from traditionalists in an effort to present gender setup, the gender setup of one of equal and mutual benefit. Uh, gender social construction is flat out deny that sex differences exist, and we know that to be patently false. And in that respect, I'm on board with the traditionalists, or basically anyone who recognizes that that's idiotic and false. But traditionalists don't stop there. They take it a step further by claiming that the differences between the sexes are largely complementary to each other, meaning simply that each sex fulfills and balances out the other's respective needs and weaknesses. Now, a while back, Barbara also made a video uh, where he talked about commensurate compensation with respects to the labor a modern traditional wife and homemaker has to perform compared to that of her husband, and demonstrated that this exchange is by no means commensurate. The purpose of this video is to demonstrate by means of examination of our past evolutionary history as a species, whether or not the alleged complementary differences cited by so many are commensurate, or simply put, who gets the short end of the stick, cui bono. Now, none of this can be ascertained without putting the past under examination, and by past, I mean the last 100,000 plus years. But before proceeding, it is important to have a look at what element of what I will refer to as the argument of completion, because by making the claim that the sexes and their difference uh, and their differences complement each other, one is effectively making the claim that they evolved to complement each other. And as we shall see, this is completely fallacious. Uh, to begin with, the argument of completion carries with the assertion that natural selection, the force by which evolution is governed, has a purposeful aim, i.e. men and women evolved to complement each other. But we know what, ev what evolution is, and we know that evolution is a mechanical process without thought, purpose, or any form of intentionality that humans may project upon it. Using the argument of completion is more or less the same as the argument from design. And this is easy to come to as a conclusion since uh, intelligent complex organisms such as human beings do, do have a form of purpose, namely the purpose they make for themselves, be it writing a book, playing a sport, going to work, or doing anything that's part of the extras outside of reproductive survival. Purpose and intentionality can only exist for complex, highly conscious organisms. Rocks, stars, atoms, none of these things has purpose. They simply are. And here it is, the most important, here's the most important distinction between function, uh, sorry, pardon me, and here the most important thing to do here is to distinguish between function and purpose. And many things have functions, few, has a pur few have a purpose, since purpose must be observed to be contrived, specifically contrived by complex brains. Where there is no complex brain, there can be no purpose. Reproduction is a function, not a purpose, and as such will have proceeded along whatever lines were most expedient in ensuring reproduction took place, complementary or not. Quote, for evolutionary biologists, the flower of the magnolia has a function, but not a purpose. It was not designed in order to propagate the species, much less to delight us with its beauty, but instead came into existence because mag magnolias with brightly colored flowers reproduce more prolifically than magnolias with less colored flowers. Sorry, less brightly colored flowers. The unsettling, this, the unsettling implication of this purely material explanation is that in the, except in the case of human behavior, and this is my note, by behavior, the author means what we've discussed above in terms of decisions, choices, and intentions, we need not invoke, nor can we find any of evidence for an, any design, goal, or purpose anywhere in the natural world. It must be emphasized that all of science has come to adapt the way of thought that Darwin applied to biology. Astronomers do not seek the purpose of comets or supernovas, nor chemists the purpose of hydrogen bonds. The concept of purpose plays no part in scientific explanations, end quote. Thus, to speak of women and men complementing each other is specious, and it implies either design or that each evolved to fill in the gaps of the other. But this is not enough. 
and there are data available that can show that only by skewing the meaning of complementary can anyone even remotely arrive at such a conclusion, namely that men and women complement each other. Uh, when looking at the equation of man and woman in any depth, the first premise that must be established is that sperm is cheap and an ovum or an egg is expensive. This is elementary reasoning. A man might only require 30 seconds to impregnate a woman, but in the in aftermath of that impregnation, a woman requires nine months as well as the time after giving birth to rear the child. Ultimately, it's a question of time investment in relation to the perceived value of the person with respect to that time. You can replace virtually any sperm, any man as a sperm donor, but not do so with a woman, and thus based on this premise, you would likely be able to find unidirectional evidence to support the idea that women were afforded far greater care, attention, and concern than men based on the simple equation of sperm is cheap, eggs are expensive. Or you could look at it this way. What are you going to take better care of? A disposable Bic razor from a pack of 10 for $3 or a $300 electric razor? The most damning piece of evidence can be found in the records of our past biology. Quote, the single most underappreciated fact about gender, he said, is the ratio of our male to female ancestors. While it's true that about half of all people who ever lived were men, the typical man was much more likely than the typical woman to die without reproducing. Citing DNA research, Dr. Baumeister explained that today's human population is descended from twice as many women as men. Maybe 80% of women reproduced, whereas only 40% of men did. It would be shocking if these vastly different reproductive odds for men and women fail to produce some personality differences, he, uh, he said, and continued. For women, throughout history and prehistory, the odds of reproducing have been pretty good. Later in this talk, we will ponder things like, why was it so rare for a hundred women to get together and build a ship and sail off to explore unknown regions, whereas men have fairly regularly done such things? But taking chances like that would be stupid from the perspective of a biological organism seeking to reproduce. They might drown, or be killed by savages, or catch a disease. For women, the optimal thing to do is to go along with the crowd, be nice, play it safe. The odds are good that men will come along and offer sex, and you'll be able to have babies. All that matters is the best offer. Ruth descended from women who played it safe. For men, the outlook was radically different. If you go along with the crowd and play it safe, the odds are you won't have children. Most men who ever lived did not have descendants who are alive today. Their lines were dead ends. Hence, it was necessary to take changes, try the new things, be creative, explore other possibilities. So 20% of past women didn't make it, and 60% of past men didn't make it. And it certainly benefited the species greatly, placing the welfare of the female above that of the male 50,000 years ago. But as Girl Rights What had once said, one life more valuable than, any, than the other. That's the equation every time, and our prehistory proves it. So let's briefly look at that statement, we're descended from women who played it safe. What does that mean in concrete, modern terms? It means an unwillingness to accept personal responsibility and above all, a willingness to make use of proxy agents, almost invariably male. Proxy agents for violence, proxy agents for the absorption of violence, proxy agents for resource provision, proxy agents for everything. What that statement also entails is what most men have long suspected, in that the man-woman equation, women have displayed a unidirectional, unilateral interest in their own welfare, with men displaying the exact same interest being unilateral and unidirectional in female welfare. Fast forward to late 2012 and you have the added factor of the state showing that same unilateral unidirectional interest in the welfare of women as well. Now I want to briefly talk about population bottlenecks. And here's a description, quote, a population bottleneck is an event that drastically reduces the size of a population. The bottleneck may be caused by various events such as an environmental disaster, the hunting of a species to the point of distinction, or habitat destruction that results in the deaths of organisms. The population bottleneck produces a de 
de decrease in the gene pool of the population because many alleles or gene variants that were present in the original population are lost. Due to the event, the remaining population has had a very low level, has a very low level of genetic diversity, which means that the population as a whole has few genetic characteristics. There have been several population bottlenecks throughout human history, and the one I would like I'd like to discuss here is the Toba super eruption. Between 69,000 and 77,000 years ago, a volcanic eruption occurred at Lake Toba in what is now modern Indonesia. It's posited that after this eruption, which is which is one of the largest in planetary history, the Earth suffered from a six to ten year volcanic winter, along with an almost one thousand year cooling period. One now widely accepted hypothesis is that the human population underwent a bottleneck effect as a result of this eruption, with figures as low as three thousand, ten thousand humans surviving between one hundred thousand to fifty thousand years ago, along with the current genetic research suggesting that modern humans all descend from 1,000 to 10,000 individuals approximately 70,000 years ago. The discrepancy between the sexes in terms of lineage is telling. Quote, Just as mitochondria are inherited matrilineally, Y chromosomes are inherited patrilineally. Y chromosomal TMRCA, and this is my note, to most recent common ancestor, that's what that stands for, to most recent common ancestor, the time of the Y chromosomal atom lie in the 42 to 100 KY range, which is a little less than half the TMRCA of MT, that is mitochondrial DNA. Importantly, the genetic evidence suggests that most of the recent, the most recent patriarch of all humanity is much more recent than the most recent matriarch, suggesting that Adam and Eve were not alive at the same time. While Eve is believed to have lived more than 140,000 years ago, Adam appears to have lived less than 110,000 years ago. According to Wilder, the lower t uh, TMRCA of Y is due to an effective population size of males, one half that of females over most of human evolution. Now this tells us a few things. One, that throughout human evolution, the population size of males was effectively half that of females, up to, through, and after the bottleneck ca caused by the Tobin eruption. This could only have been achieved if consistent preference had been given to females in regards to survival. With a population as potentially small as the one resulting from the aftermath of the Tobin eruption, assuming a constant rate uh, of 80, uh, or constant ratio of 80% female to 40% male, Female genetic material, as well as their preferences for the kind of males they chose to mate with, was reinforced even more strongly because of the bottleneck. And because with a population so low, most males inevitably would have begun killing each other off in an effort to reproduce with females, male on male competition at its worst, of course, bringing about an even greater decrease in the male population than which had resulted from the volcanic eruption itself. Uh, this lends credence to the idea that men have long been what women wanted them to be since in such a bottleneck population, with a large majority of that population being f female and a very small minority being male, and that self-same minority engaging in internecine conflict to achieve dominance over each other, very few males would have remained or survived, whereas proportionally speaking, many females would have remained to offer input and present directives to the males. So basically women shaping exactly what they want in men, shaping men to be what they want men to be. Now let us have a brief look at cuckoldry, and I'll talk more about this at a later date. Cuckoldry in, is basically mimicking the bird which practices the same thing. Uh, and cuckoldry in humans is simply when one man donates the sperm uh, and another man raises the child that resulted from that sperm. That's what cuckoldry is in a nutshell. So evolutionarily speaking, cuckoldry offered the advantage to the woman that she obtained genetic material from a so-called alpha male and had a reliable so-called beta provider to raise the child resulting from medallions with the alpha. Quote, it is often suggested that 10% of children are not biologically related to their putative genetic fathers. In a recent review of 67 studies, Anderson distinguished between the studies of high and low paternity confidence samples and found median rates of actual 
uh, non-paternity determined from blood or DNA exclusion tests of 2% to 30% respectively uh, with uh, much variability across uh, studies. These data are supported by fairly high rates of extramarital affairs in both men and women. In a recent set of sample of 9,852 Norwegians aged 18 to 49, 16% of men and 11% of women admitted to having an affair uh, during their current relationship with 50% not using any form of contraception. Quote. So the numbers vary a great deal, anywhere from 2 to 30%, with 10% from what I've often heard and read uh, being an off-sided average. Now it's true that to the sperm donor, cuckoldry is advantageous, but to the provider, who is providing for the children that, that, is not, that are not his, it is a complete loss. To the woman, she obtains the best of all worlds. Yeah. Thus, even if cult, thus, even if cuckoldry is rare, it is significant enough and recurrent enough to be taken into account in male-female reproduction. Women have a decided advantage in this in that they always know that it's their child. The father or purported to father, however, does not. So that's cuckoldry. Another way in which men and women allegedly complement each other. So it's safe to say that natural selection has favored the female in the function of reproduction. And since reproduction is always the driving force behind every species, this favoritism affords them uncounted benefits with regards to the derivatives of that reproductive status, with regards to, well, all the amenities that exist in society, the social, financial benefits, etc. What exactly here is complementary? Because I'm missing it. Only a select few males will ever obtain an advantage from the arrangement that evolved over millennia in our evolution, and virtually all females will benef benefit from it. So calling the sexes complementary is a bit like saying uh, mismatching pieces of a jigsaw puzzle fit together after you snip away at them for hours with a pair of scissors in an effort to get them to fit, and then you glue and weld them together. Sooner or later, it's bound to fall apart, and that's exactly where we are today.